Good morning and welcome to the American Chamber on Thursday morning. Thursday, the 11th today? It's Valentine's Day on Saturday, so it must be the 12th today. Uh, today, uh, my name is Colin Brown. I'm the chair of the Apparel and Footwear Committee for the American Chamber. I'm also the managing director and vice president of VF Corporation. Um, many of you might not know VF Corporation, but many of you, you will know the brands that we own and we operate. Uh, we own brands like Timberland, Vans, The North Face, Reef, Nautica, Lee, Wrangler, and a whole host of brands. Uh, and I basically run the supply chain uh, for those brands based out of this part of the world. Um, so today's event is something that w is pretty high on our agenda and something which is pretty important to us. Um, a couple of um, housekeeping rules before we kind of kick off. If I could ask you all to put your mobile phones on stun, please, or on silent, uh, and uh, so that uh, we don't have any disturbances during the presentations today. Um, just a, a couple of housekeeping things as well. You'll notice that we're all wearing different colored badges. Uh, and individuals wearing red badges are the governors and trustees for the organization. I see Richard at the back there. I'm not sure if we've got any other red badges here. But uh, uh, those individuals wearing yellow badges, such as myself, are committee chairs. And those members that have blue dots on their badges are uh, members. Uh, and those of you that do not have American Chamber badges should hang your heads in shame. <laughs> you should be members. This is the, probably the most influential chamber in Hong Kong. And as you can tell, I'm even not American, I'm English. And I chair one of the committees here because it is such an important chamber. So I would encourage you to join this amazing number of events. And certainly in my, in my uh, group at the moment, I met with Richard yesterday and talked about some of the things we're planning this year. But we're planning, we have door knocks to Washington coming up with regards to how we're looking to try and influence uh, our industry uh, on the hill in the US. And uh, we're also looking at doing a, a trip to Cambodia to try and talk to the government in Cambodia. And there's even discussions about perhaps trying to do some type of trip to Africa later in the year as well. So lots going on, a really active committee and a really active chamber. But today, you're not here to hear me talk about my committee. You're here to talk, hear these three fine gentlemen talk about supply chain risk and planning. Uh, the three people we have this morning is Marco, George and Philip. And I'll let them introduce themselves as they go through their individual sections. But we're going to be talking specifically about managing risk sourcing and value and tax efficiency. At the end of the morning, we'll have some time for questions as well. So without further ado, I'll pass it over to you gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Marco Liu. Uh, I'm, I'm born and grew up in uh, Hong Kong, but I live in, I'm currently living, living in Shanghai. I live in Shanghai for nine years already. Uh, my major um, uh, clients, you know, include multinational clients and also state enterprises. And, uh, and I help them to manage risk. So uh, this is the topic. Oops. Okay. Okay, so uh, this is the topic that I'm going to cover today, how to effectively manage your supply chain risk. Um, these are the headlines that I'm sure, you know, every day, when you open your news, the newspaper, uh, you see that you know companies, you know, uh, they are suffering, you know, from um, um, disruption, you know, of the business, you know, because of risks that either they did not know, or they know it, but didn't manage it properly, and it turns out to become a disaster. Uh, some of the names here, uh, not all the names here, are, are from the apparel and uh, footwear company, uh, but you can see that. Uniqlo, you know, um, you know, suffering, you know, uh, from their from their suppliers. Uh, there's a factory collapse in Bangladesh, and uh, which uh, caused, you know, definitely, you know, like um, uh, some people's life. And uh, and George will cover uh, that story, you know, in more detail later. Um, and then, of course, you know, I live in China. Food safety is always uh, an issue that uh, that we concern, you know, actually, you know, daily. You know, whenever, whenever you know you 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 you're buying, uh, buy buy products, you know, from Carry Four, you know, come from uh, from uh, uh, from Sam's Clubs, you know, like you will question, you know, like whether this is safe, you know, can I trust 
the retailer who is selling this product. And actually, China is you know having a more and more stringent you know food safety rules. You know that really, re that that will that will change you know the whole industry. Um, of course, you know when we talk about China, you know I'm not sure how familiar you are, you are with China. You know, like when you look at the laws, you know, uh, it always looks impossible. You know, like, well, how can we deliver that? In the past, um, uh, 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 many companies, you know, they understand that okay, through relationship, you know, through uh, better managing the regulator, the government officials, you know, we can bypass that. But I'm sure you can tell, you know, in the last two years, the whole environment has changed. A couple of days ago, uh, you probably you read from the news that Qualcomm, you know, got a really heavy penalty, you know, for uh, violating the anti-monopoly uh, rules, which is something that you know kind of exists, you know, for 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 for, for a few years, you know, but uh, but but nobody knows, you know, like when they will get hit, you know, and same for supply chain, you know, like I'm sure, you know. Uh, when your, your, your colleagues in China, you know, will tell you that, you know, when you, when you, when you approach a, uh, a, a supplier, you know, or when you approach a, 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 a new area, they'll tell you that, okay, well, we know the way, you know, how to handle it, you know, this is the industry norm. But today, you cannot trust that, you know, because, you know, uh, the, the government, you know, they are trying to enforce the law. And, uh, and and actually, you know, many companies, you know, they're facing, you know, really heavy penalties, you know, because of violating it. Uh, we have helping, you know, like a German company, German auto company, you know, to, to deal with the the uh, the anti anti monopoly uh, law, and also we have helping uh, a lot of pharmaceutical company in China, you know, in uh, in dealing with the uh, anti corruption law. And these are the things that happen. These are the risks that exist in your supply chain. So if we put all the risks together in one picture, how should how will it look like? So this is uh, we will try it, and you can see that you know like from the outset, there are lots of you know uh, risks you know that you need to consider: uh, economical, environmental, social responsibility, geopolitical, hazard, infrastructure, resources, regulation, security, information security. You know is a, a, always a big risk in China. You know, think about Apple, you know, before the iPhone 6 is official, officially released. In China, you know, we already have received a lot of information about it. This is again, you know, like Apple trusts his subcontractor, you know, which manufactured the, 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 the cell phone for them, you know, to safeguard the, 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 this uh, highly confidential information. But you still find it in, in the market way before it is its official launch. Um, so these are the, are, the, are the risks, you know, from the outside that we need, may not have the ability to manage it directly, but we need to be aware of it. We need to assess it. What if it happened to us? How are we going to respond? And certainly, you know, along the supply chain, uh, many companies, you know, start using third parties, you know, uh, to, 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 to manage, uh, to, to uh, to provide you, you know, like to produce the products for you, to distribute the products for you. Um, one of the one of the major service we do in uh, in China is for the auto company to help them to manage the dealers. Um, think about Mercedes, think about BMW. You know, they have spent so much, you know, in R and D, you know, to develop, you know, a luxurious car to build a brand, and they need to rely on the local dealers to sell the cars. And the dealership industry actually is, some, is something that, that is, uh, that is uh, quite, uh, what's, the, what's the right term I should use? Uh, it, it is, it is you know, it's highly fermented. You know? There are so many different dealers you know, in the market. Um, they are, you know, uh, ethical standard, I would say is, is quite wary. You know? Some large one. In, the, in, in Shanghai, you know, well, maybe listed in Hong Kong, you know, in the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, you know, they are better compared to the one, you know, in uh, Shanxi, you know, in, in the remote provinces, you know, a smaller dealers. They are willing to, you know, strike a deal, you know, with the, maybe with the local government to ensure that they can sell their cars, you know, in there. But in that case, if you know the Chinese government, you know they find fault, you know, with the government official, then the dealers, you know, 
will be will be probably will be will be um, you know will be will, will um, the, pop, the, the the dealers will be involved, and eventually, the auto OEMs will be involved will be penalized. So, something like that you know is seems to be remote you know, but actually if you don't manage it, the problems you know can become worse you know um, in in a, in a very fast pace. Again, you know, I, uh, there are other risks, you know, like functional risks uh, involving finance, HR, information technology, and legal that companies, you know, need to pay attention to. Okay, so if we put it into a uh, straight line, you know, from procurement to sales, you know, like these are the risks that we often find that, you know, companies, you know, may face. Uh, but certainly these are the risks that you can manage proactively. For example, you know, which supplier you should choose. Um, for example, like inventory, how do you store your inventory? Uh, production, distribution, and sales. Uh, what is affecting the risk in here, actually a lot of the time, is the management initiative that we have, you know, uh, launch, you know. Uh, for example, like lean manufacturing, um, uh, lean manufacturing, just in time inventory. Uh, like these are very, very good initiatives to, to help you reduce the cost and improve efficiencies. But at the same time, it brings you risk because you, are, you become less flexible. When a disruption happened, can your supply, if you, there, if you reduce your number of suppliers to just two or three, if one of them have a problem, can the other pick up the, pick up the order right away? to meet your needs. So this is something you know, that, that we need to consider. In 2013, uh, Deloitte has done a global survey you know, uh, for, the, for the manufacturer and also retailer uh, to discuss about supply chain risks. You know, we want to learn you know, how, how do they think about, about the risk, you know, how are they managing it right now. Uh, this is the result. Um, uh, this is about uh, the types of risks you know, that most concern you know, within the extended value chain. The value chain has become uh, longer and longer these days. Uh, and you can see that uh, you know, change in demand and market structure you know, uh, got the most attention, 43%. But if you look at the ranked number one risk, actually it's here. Suppliers execution failure or avail availability. Because you know, we outsource a lot of you know, production our supplier and also rely on our supplier to give us you know the high quality you know materials you know that we can work on and people are really concerned about that they cannot meet this demand so how to manage your supply chain risk this is our methodology you know I won't bore you with all the academic stuff but very simple you know you need to assess the risk you know what are the risks that we may face and then you need to determine the risk exposure you know if it happened how bad can it be? How likely that will happen? And then we need to evaluate and prioritize our strategy. You know, we have limited resources. We cannot manage all the risks. You know, if we, we if we concern too much about risk, you know, that we won't be able to do business. So we need to do some prioritization. And then we need to, uh, you know, execute our risk mitigation plan. You know, we need to address it. Uh, for some key risks, we probably need to do a simulation. Uh, I remember uh, back in 2003, uh, at that time I was uh, actually uh, working for the CEO of uh, Deloitte in China. And uh, at that time, uh, you know, the biggest event is SARS in Hong Kong. And uh, when we, before we enter into 2004, uh, the question the CEO asked me is, how should we prepare for SARS again this year? What if it happened? You know, we did last year, Good, we survive. You know, like luckily, you know, the the, the 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 damage is not that big. But what if it happened again this year? So we have done some simulation. You know, we have uh, done some backup plan. You know, where we check with IT. You know, can our people you know work from home? You know, if if, if, if SARS happened again, and everybody cannot go go on the street. You know, so things like that. You know, we need to think about a simulation, and definitely we need to do some. Uh, Continuous monitoring, you know, risk is changing. Uh, I'm sure, you know, MNC these days, you know, like regulatory risk, you know, has become their top priority. 
or most of the most of the MNC I talked to today. Yeah, and uh, so this is uh, the way you manage risk. And uh, and with we talk about effective strategy, you know, like I, I put down you know some some points in here. I won't go through that all of them in detail, but I would like to talk more about da using data analytics. Uh, this is uh, specifically um, important for MNC. Uh, for Chinese company, it's less important because they don't have data. For MNC, they have invested a lot. You know, I'm sure you guys have SAP, Oracle, you know, you have, uh, you know, like BI, you know, software, you know, lots of different things. So how well are you using your data? That's the question for you to consider. Uh, so these are the, are the things we, we usually, uh, we can do, you know, to help our client, you know, like doing data analytics. Uh, internal control, you know, how to better, you know, identify fraud, you know, improve your control. Uh, portfolio optimization, operating model transformation, uh, operation improvement, working capital reduction, network optimization, suppliers network improvement, event driven risk management, you know, these are all the things that you can do, you know, with your data. Uh, you know, when we talk about data analytics, you know, a lot of the time is, what if? You, we understand the past from the data, and then you ask, what if? If I change this model, how will it look like? You know, it's as simple as that. Yeah. And uh, I want to talk more about uh, internal control in here, because in the past two years, uh, I'm so glad, you know, well, no, I should not say so, I'm so glad. Because of the GSK incident in China, we have been earning more than $50 million from the pharmaceutical company for doing not just data analytics. Our first phase is usually is doing investigation. So the situation is Pfizer, uh, Roche, we, are, we all understand, they all understand that there's a problem in, with this industry. Their distributor uh, have to uh, pay extra money to the healthcare professional to promote their drugs. I put it this way, you know, in a nicer terms. Yeah. So this is something wrong. This is something that is wrong. They need to stop it. They need to stop it. But how are they going to ensure that these things does not happen? So I t I'm telling you, you know, what, what we did. Well, first of all, it's investigation. So these company, you know, their legal counsel back in head office, you know, they are really, really, uh, um, they're really, really concerned about this risk in China. So they hire us, they hire a bunch of lawyers, you know, to come to China and to do a full of investigation. I'm talking about 100%, almost 100% check on the travel and entertainment expenses. And this is crazy, you know. We're talking about millions of dollars, you know, uh, of professional fees spending on checking the invoice to ensure that, okay, well, this is right, it looks good, you know. Oh, but this one, you know, where well, you pay $500,000 to a travel agency, for what? So we need to investigate, we need to understand, you know, what have been done, yeah. It is not very effective, but we have to do it that way because that's what the lawyers like, you know. And uh, they, need to, they need to have 100% assurance that we are clean. What's next? It is not sustainable, you know. We cannot ask internal order, we cannot ask, you know, keep hiring the law, you know, to do, do this, you know, for, you know, in the, you know, for, uh, in the future. So we suggest them to do data analytics. Look at your data. You know, from analyzing your data, you know, we, we have done some analysis, you know, transaction analysis, you know, risk score, you know, we look at, you know, like the, the, the vendors, you know, and then rank them, you know, based on different factors, you know, uh, location, uh, uh, volumes of transactions, uh, you know, uh, 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 number of, uh, you know, like uh, reported uh, complaints, you know, things like that. And then we list out the top 10 vendors and then give them a risk scoring. Um, and also, you know, we do some, you know, Banford law, using the Banford law analysis to analyze the invoice, you know, checking whether, you know, whether there are people splitting the invoice, you know, to try to, you know, like uh, keep it under the, 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 the approval limits, you know, and we, we, we can actually, you, it is very difficult to, 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 to identify this pattern if you just do, you know, simple sampling, you know. Uh, but if you use, you know, uh, data analytics, take out the data, you know, analyze 100%, 
comfort, you know, the sample, the, the, the population actually is 100%. The sample size become 100%. And, and then you can identify, you know, like who are the, who are the risky person, you know, like, well, for this guy, you know, like he usually uh, have uh, expense claim, you know, close to the, to the end of the month, you know, because he need to rush, you know, to meet his sales target. And then we find that, you know, he claim, you know, for example, his, his, his uh, approval limit is $10,000. We find that, you know, most of, most of his, uh, his uh, expense claim is between $9,000 to $10,000. So this is the guy that we need to pay attention to. So it's very effective, you know. It is, uh, we utilize something that you already have, you know. We are not creating something new, you know. It is, it is the treasure that a lot of companies have never touched on. So nowadays, you know, when I, come, when, when I visit the, uh, my MNC clients, you know, a few things, you know, always come up. First, regulatory compliance. How can we better manage the, my regulator, you know? Will I be the next one being investigated? And the second question is, how can I improve my data analytics? Okay, so uh, so uh, what people do, you know, like uh, uh, using, using their data, uh, these are the, are the things that is very popular, financial risk, you know, modeling, uh, supply chain operation, uh, risk intelligence, um, and also predictive modeling, risk sensing, uh, I just got a project from a U.S. Uh, food and beverage company. They're going to build a risk sensing uh, system because food safety is their concern. And they cannot just rely on, you know, sending the people to check the, 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 the suppliers, you know, factory, you know, uh, more frequently. That is not effective. But they find out that, you know, there are lots of data out there, both internal and also external, you know. Um, so they, 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 we're going to help them to build a risk sensing model. So we, every day we'll collect, you know, uh, information, you know, from uh, Dun & Bradstreet, well, in the U.S., I'm talking about Dun & Bradstreet, from Dow Jones, you know, like there are lots of news, you know, about this company or the related industry. And then we'll put them together, together with the internal data, and then we build a scoring model, and which is something that you know, can if, for example, like uh, uh, the companies, you know, the factory, you know, has uh, have a labor strike going on, then this this is definitely something that we need to pay attention because you know that will affect that will affect our 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 uh, uh, the the, the supplier's ability to provide the goods timely. Uh, my last slides, you know, uh, what is the effective strategy for preventing and recovering from negative outcome? Uh, Certainly, you know, a lot of measures are used, you know, none of them is really outstanding, you know, the highest score, you know, is only 24%, you know, but it's, first of all, you know, build a stronger relationship with your value chain, you know, uh, your supplier, your dealers. Uh, second one is quite interesting, it's our business continuity plan. Uh, this is something that I assume most of the company have, you know, uh, but recently we just uh, fit help uh, a uh, American footwear company uh, to finish their business continuity plan for the logistics. Uh, this is something I'm, I'm, I'm quite shocked because, you know, that company is well established. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's quite well known, you know, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in their supply chain management. But they also see that, you know, they cannot afford this risk if it happened. Yeah, well, because, you know, the logistics, they rely heavily on, uh, they rely heavily on the logistic company, you know, to help them to deliver the goods on time. So what if something wrong with the warehouse, you know, with the, with the, with the, with the, uh, 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 with the fleet? How should they respond? Okay. So uh, that's it for my presentation. I'm happy to take some questions, you know, at the Q&A session. All right. The next one will be George. Thank you. So over the past decade, low-cost country sourcing has shaped global supply chain. And that's primarily been the, um, one of the main focus areas, critical uh, areas that have driven, uh, that has driven the Chinese economy. So this same wisdom is seeing a shift in low cost country sourcing to other regions, uh, such as Vietnam, uh, India, Bangladesh. 
But that in and of itself um, brings some other risks. So outside of the cost of labor, there's additional risk on infrastructure, uh, risk on geopolitical stability, um, and general safety issues. So the key thing today that we would like to just pick up on, uh, I'm not going to be discussing in so much detail, but at least to get people starting to think not just low-cost country sourcing, but best value sourcing. This would allow for you to evaluate how do I optimize um, our operating model to have a uh, commercially and operationally aligned uh, supply chain. So just to start off with, I'm going to look at, illustrate some, some images that probably you've seen in the news um, to discuss some of the key points that I'd like to raise. So China has its challenges, and there's no need hiding that. Uh, you know, we've seen the, the increase in labor wages, the shortage in labor within the region. That being said, I mean, you, because of the competition and the maturity of the China market, migrant workers have that flexibility to be able to travel within the coastal region, within different parts of the country, for work. So as a result, you end up in situations where there is that labor shortage. You have empty, um, empty factories. This trend potentially will continue to, to go, but at what pace? Uh, pace. Um, it's something that we need to, to closely monitor. There's also a shrinking um, uh, working population. And, and this is going on year on year. And then if you look at, depending on which province, whether you're looking at the Guangdong province or other provinces within China, um, year on year labor wage increase is in excess of 13%. So why is China still an interesting destination for, for clients to look for uh, multinational corporations to consider? Because of the past decade, um, the, the evolution and activity that has happened in China, you have a more educated workforce in which this translates into productivity and the work that, um, that you would expect for within the segment. Because of also a more advanced infrastructure in comparison to some of the neighboring countries, uh, this allows for improved mobility, and then from a logistics standpoint, an overall supply chain, hopefully drive some of your logistics costs. And then there's advanced technology. So going forward, it's not just about uh, sourcing for the lowest cost, but you're looking at the complete value chain. How am I going to be able to reduce my total landed cost? So beyond just raw material, what is the length of my supply chain? Um, what are the activities that I have to go through? How efficient is my workforce in being able to deliver that? So we've looked at the, the China challenges and also some of the upsides associated with that. So earlier on, I mentioned about the shift in the market uh, to locations like Vietnam, Bangladesh, and India the Philippines. We touched on infrastructure. These are things that businesses need to consider. Outside of the lowest cost option, what are some other risks and potentially what is it going to cost us in the long run? So this specific example that Marco alluded to earlier on um, ended up costing in excess of $3 billion. The key thing is not to have just the short-term view, but what is also that medium and long-term approach that the business has. Another example is Thailand. So as a risk, we talked about geopolitical risks, um, potential uh, natural disasters. 
these are things that also need to be looked at closely. If you end up in a situation where you move into a location that has a higher possibility of some of these issues, not only would you have an impact on your revenue, but the question now is even when things go back to normal, will you regain your market share? So we've looked at China's challenges. We've looked at some of the other players. Um, this chart would show you that there's huge um, annual growth in locations like Bangladesh, Vietnam, India. They're growing faster than China, but China's not losing market share. And, and this is a key message. So it's actually growing. It's, you still have uh, an increase of about 5.4% market share from 2009 to 2013. So China will always remain, I think, for the foreseeable future, um, a big contender and a dominant player. So even if you look at the total exports and you, you combine all of the countries listed here, they still no, no, um, do not come closely to, to, uh, to what's happening in the China, the, the China market. I see some people are struggling trying to, to read what's on um, the, the projector. One thing, we, we will be distributing through an app um, all of the slides uh, that were presented today. Just so that you know. So in summary, in trying to decide on what is the best model for your business, um, this particular chart shows a number of key categories that typically businesses would look at in, in trying to make that decision. You know, so your market opportunities, political environment, macroeconomic environment, financing, and so on and so forth. If we look at the countries to the right of China, you'll notice that there isn't that significant difference in the overall scoring. But when you look at this side by side with the associated risk, we're doing business in some of these other locations, you could see that China becomes more of an attractive uh, option. So what's changing, and why is it that China is still a dominant player? If we look at the evolution from where we were 15 years, 10 years ago, to now, it's not all about just low-cost country manufacturing uh, to, ex uh, to export to um, external uh, markets, but it's also looking at you know, we've evolved. Uh, this technology has been implemented. Um, there's been advancements. We're looking at global best practices um, and a, a consumption market, a consumer market. So not just production, but a combination of this is a large and the largest uh, consumer market region. So businesses, in trying to decide on where to locate their operation, are thinking not only where am I get where, where am I going to get the optimal cost structure, but also what's the proximity to my consumer base. So in summary, some of these points I've already talked uh, through, but China remains attractive because of productivity. It's invested in its workforce. They have decades of experience. Um, we've heard horror stories earlier on when you had this shift in low-cost country um, 
new company setting up operations in China, a lot of those challenges were faced, but I would say that nowadays those are significantly reduced. And you're going to see that same journey in some of the regional contenders. Another advantage of China is the complete value chain. So we're not just looking at manufacturing, but what about the sourcing of the raw materials? Um, what about distribution, so the infrastructure with regards to, to logistics? And then the customer base. So in comparison to most of these other regional contenders, China has the full value chain. So to put this all together, you know, we've talked about low-cost country sourcing. We've talked about looking at value sourcing. But the key thing is not to have a silo view of determining what your business's operating model is. It's how does all of this connect together? Where is my commercial and operational alignment? From a commercial standpoint, what should be my revenue, um, what should be my channels uh, to market? How am I going to be setting the pricing uh, for my items? Is it a make versus buy discussion um, that makes more sense for your portfolio? And this all ties back into then where am I going to be sourcing from? Where is my, uh, my, my customer base? I'm trying to shorten with, with everything that's happening in the market now with globalization, with um, the multi-channel strategies, um, access to internet, changing consumer demands. That uh, requires for a more um, flexible supply chain. So all of these things need to be taken into consideration together um, to be able to determine what your optimal footprint is and how you go to market. And finally, uh, we'll just like to direct you um, whenever you get an opportunity to the Deloitte Global CPO survey. And this brings in a lot of insights from CPO um, around the world uh, in terms of you know, risk, technology, um, best practices, what they're witnessing, um, the expected trends within the market. And we'll also be able to hopefully provide you with some guidance on um, things that you could do uh, to, to, to further improve your businesses. Morning, I'm Philip. I, um, I asked George to uh, switch the seat with me so that you can all see me. I am tax partner in Deloitte Hong Kong, so uh, the next section is uh, more about taxation and financial. But um, let me try to make it more less technical because uh, people say tax guy always deal with technical things. Now, when we talk about supply chain, in fact, what we're looking at is, let's assume for a moment, you deal with the uh, risk issue that Marco has talked about. You have to find the cheapest and uh, guaranteed sourcing location. Now, your group make, let's say, the, um, 20 billion revenue, 20, uh, 2 billion profit. Not bad, right? But then before tax, before taxation. So the question to the CEO is, how best you want to allocate the two billion profit within the group entities involved in the supply chain? And where are the locations that you want to keep the surplus cash? Naturally, you will say, well, if I have a choice, I will try to allocate my profit in the place where I pay less tax, because you want to make sure that the after-tax profit is given to the group, the company, and the shareholders. Right? And you also want to keep the cash in the places where there is less control, a lot like China, India, where there is forex things control, Lot more like Hong Kong is like a financial center that you can easily assess and move cash. But the fact is, your wishes may not be respected by the tax authority. They have jurisdiction over each of the entities that are involved in the group supply chain. 
manufacturing, distribution, development of IP. So in a way, the supply chain, what I call normally business model of, of more business model optimization, is how best you can identify your value chain in a way that you design your own value chain, alike with your business model or business presence, in such a way that you can create tax efficiency. All right. Now, the best alignment of these offerings can create value to the global tax strategy and treasury strategy. Now, you may think, why do I have to do that? I just go on with my operation, and then naturally, they will be in the best shape. But unfortunately, operational-wide optimal doesn't mean tax-wise efficient. Now, especially, in fact, to a certain extent, when you design your supply chain, there are certain tax elements you already embedded. And you may heard about more like the terms now, more days, transfer pricing, tax avoidance. It is about how a group within itself is to transact within the entities. And that turnaround can give the tax authorities in different places the opportunities to draw more profit into their jurisdiction rather than that of the others. Now, if you look at the pipe chart, <clears throat> Below, I can read some of you is, well, if you look at the business, essentially they are composed of different value drivers. Typically, there may be intellectual property, technology, research and development, marketing, procurement, manufacturing, and distribution. This basically even not all inclusive, are almost like the most common value driver in a business. They happen in different places. They also are embraced in different legal entities. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not asking you to say, well, just put some of those in a tax haven jurisdiction, and then you can enjoy tax saving. It no longer works, because the tax authority are quite aware of this. What we have to play, in a way, is you align the value driver in a tax-efficient manner, and you also make sure that there are management, like people resources, being located in the right place to manage them. And that's where you try the efficiency. If I have to give a simple example, R&D. Right now, we say R&D, IP, is what you can drive your business. You play the better, I'll play the others. For example, let's say you have to do R&D in um, software R&D in India. This is a very tax complicated country. All right? If you put your, all your people over there, it will be difficult. The other way to play is you maintain the core IP development in your own offices. Let's assume that be in Hong Kong or US. How do you do that? You can subcontract the IP to India, whether it be a related company of your own or another unrelated company. You give them a budget, all right? You give them the target. They work out for you. The upside is whatever the outcome is created, it belongs to you as the principal, whether it be a US company or a Hong Kong company. But then if that, it doesn't derive the outcome that you desire, unfortunately, you have to bear the risk. But the risk is the cost that you pay for them. right? Naturally, the cost that they have to incur plus a little bit of margin per the market benchmark. Now, if you look at this relationship, you already put your activities in a country that is of high risk, high tax. But then you put the benefit of the outcomes in the country of your own. The choice, US, it will be still a high tax places. The choice, Hong Kong, it will be relatively low. With the IP of such a mobile assets, you can register them, and then you could use the IP in your own business. So that's why once you can identify the value drivers, the next is then how best you can utilize them in a certain ways so that you can derive the benefit, but without involving too much of a risk trying to get out of a high tax jurisdiction. Uh, if I have to get another example, manufacturing, very common, right? But if you look at manufacturing from a tax concept, from an operational concept, the most simple term is contract manufacturing versus toll manufacturing. A toll manufacturing is like a service provider. The manufacturer receives the raw materials from the principal, carry out the manufacturing in the places, and then they will return the goods. At all relevant times, the goods belong to the principal. The toll manufacturer is only a service provider. You can imagine in that case that you pay them for the labor wages plus the utilities and the markup. Contract manufacturer on the lower side, 
refer to a different situation. The contract manufacturer will be responsible for procuring the raw materials or they have to buy it from the, the principal company. Turning around then, they would have to do the value added and sell the goods back to the principal company. If you look at the physical movement, it's quite similar, but in fact, the tax result will be a lot different. If I tell you that every tax authority, if they look at this kind of two type of manufacturing, they will ask you for a cost plus return. Let's assume then they be cost plus 10%. You can then look at the lower situation where you have the raw material and the labor costs and the utilities as the total cost. Your cost base increase, the 10% increase. But if you look at it, if in fact it was the principal company who supplied the raw materials to the contract manufacturer, naturally the lower base gives you a high tax cost because of a higher cost base for the 10%. So when you arrange for manufacturing, you can look at it. And countries like Bangladesh, Vietnam, in fact, they are open for either contract manufacturing or tool manufacturing. If you don't find a way, of course, they will say, let's do contract manufacturing because that will give them, in a way, perceptionally, more related, high GDP growth. And that's exactly why in China, 20 years ago, when people moved to southern China to do manufacturing, they always do tool manufacturing. Now you're being pushed to convert your processing factory into woofies, wholly foreign oil enterprise. And then you have to do what they call contract manufacturing, where you have to buy raw materials in and then export the products. All right? That to them, if well, in a way, they have better GDP growth figure, they have more export, but the reality is you have to pay more tax on the value added because with the cost base in the past, it's only raw materials, oh, sorry, labor wages and utilities. Now the cost base become raw materials and the raw material can in fact almost double, at least double up the total cost. All right? To expand the example, you say, Philip, toll manufacturing and contract manufacturing is, is very common. Yes, let me introduce another one, licensed manufacturer. Licensed manufacturing in a way is, is the, you get a certain IP, whether it be the designed or know-how embedded on the products, or the brand that is attached to the product, right? So you get a license from a related company. Let's assume that US is the one to hold the brand name or a certain manufacturing know-how. You give a license to a subsidiary in China to manufacture it. Well, why do we do so? You know that right now, Mark, China is turning from a world manufacturing location to a consumption consumer base. You want to sell the goods in China, right? So by doing this, that means you give the right to your subsidiary in China, not only to manufacture, but to sell on their own to the end customer. The benefit of this doing this from logistic size, you can save a lot of import duty on the import of finished goods. The second is then from a tax perspective, we would naturally look for a royalty that is given by the manufacturing company in China in respect of the sales to the end customer. So the two combinations give you the more flexibility to do your marketing and sales, but then at the same time make sure that you will not put all the profit in China, which is at a tax rate of 25%, still relatively high. So if you look at this free, you go from the, a the total manufacturing situation, which will give you the lowest return in the manufacturing base, to a licensed manufacturer, which gives them the highest return. This is what we call about transfer pricing. You look at the function risk and the assets employed in each of the situation. To the extent they are low risk, then you give them less of return. For a return, to the extent that they bear more risk and function, you give them more return. And that is where, for the similar kind of transaction, you can arrange to allocate more profit to the places you like, and try not to allocate profit to the places you don't like. Now, this is a map always in my mind when I do business model optimization. All right, it's a bit complicated in a way, but then in simple terms, we try to dissect, again, the, the, uh, the function or the value driver functions, manufacturing, R&D, sales, IP markets. When we look at manufacturing, if you look at the bottom, what I say will be, well, if I look at it, should I be this uh, contract manufacturer or toll? But in fact, it's alike with the, the, more, the normal manufacturing concept. We have OEM, 
ODM, OBM, right? So how do you look at it and see, well, do I want to do the design or I want to actually design? Do I put all this in one place or I split it to make sure that that manufacturer places is only a small related in my supply chain in order to control the tax efficiency? R&D, I talk about contract R&D, right? In fact, within the tax term, we also have something called R&D cost sharing allocation. It's a situation whereby we have more than one owner. Let's say the three companies, one in US, the other in UK, the third in China, coming together to jointly develop their IP. You know that right now IP are connected. The technology migrate from one product to another, migrate from one market to another. R&D CSA is a bit technical, but in a way it's like three of us having a joint partnership to develop an IP for the use. And then we split the use either by, by let's say, territorial right, right? You have the US market, uh, the uh, UK have the European market, and then I have in China the Asia market. By doing this, then you allow them to, to jointly develop and then jointly sell the product. Sales, um, quite often you will see that MNC have a company in Hong Kong and Singapore, the regional hub, right? Well, location-wise, geographic-wise, they give you the, uh, the, the opportunity to do so because the goods are being manufactured in one part of the world and being shipped to the other part of the world. The other reason, in fact, is often the convenience and, in fact, the tax rate offered among the other jurisdictions. Hong Kong offer a 16.5% with offshore claim plausibility, which means that you can have sales in Hong Kong but don't have to pay tax. All right, but of course, you have to design and make it successful. The other one is Singapore. Singapore, if I have to use a term, is Hong Kong tax rate is non-negotiable, zero or 16.5, 16.5. Singapore is negotiable. Quite often you find that Singapore have offered you a lower tax rate. The normal tax rate is 17, but they offer something like 10, offer something like five. All right? In the market, you can decide how well they sell it. Do they sell on their own or in fact they act as a kind of limited risk distributor? All right? So the end product is something like this. You identify the function, you align the function to some of the company. One of those hold the most important function. Normally we call the principal operating company. Putting in them all the risks or the major risks and the function. And then you allocate the routine return to the rest of the sales company like a limited risk distributor, a manufacturing company, contract R&D. And in that what you can do is after allocating from what we call a transfer pricing, the routine return for the normal risk company, the residual profit will be kept in the principal operating company. Right. Now, uh, for those uh, management guys, financial guys, or primes, I want to share with you a term. Um, this is space erosion profit shifting, all right? BEPS, you will hear more and more about it. It was first driven by G20. Now, an action by OECD country with another 10 non-OECD country joining. Basically, these major tax economy are joining their forces to fight harmful tax practice. That create long taxation in certain way, which is in fact tax avoidance arrangement, BEPS. All right? And that in fact, apart from the OECD country, the, the other 10 non-OECD countries include China, India, Russia, Brazil. So you can never imagine all major economies are in this joint force under BEPS. When will it be coming? December 2015, the end of this year, it will be come up with various actions, including how to deal with digital transactions, more disclosure of the company business. You may think, why should I have to disclose all my business to you? If I have a company in your place, let's assume US, then I just tell you what I'm doing in US. No. This is what, that's why they have to do it. They say, all right, for every MNC, you have to prepare three types of document. One, a master documentation telling them how are your business arranged, each of the legal entities. A local documentation telling how US is operate. A last one, country by country report. What is country by country report? Well, two things. One, the con quantitative. They have to let you know, and you have to disclose it, in each of the jurisdictions, your revenue, your profit, your tax, your accrual tax, accrual tax. And then, in fact, they have to see how many people you employ. 
if you have this kind of transparency, it's easy even for a layman to understand that you have the least resources in one place, but the most corporate in the, the place. So that's why, as I said, I'm not proposing you to, don't get me wrong, to put some things, one or two person in office in the tax haven jurisdiction and put it over there. It's like a safe deposit box that will be opened by the tax authority sooner or later. All right? So all in all, what I'm trying to say here is, in any case, you have to plan. If you don't plan, you're likely plan for fail. The tax authority will lock at your door sometime or later. With MNC, definitely there exists opportunities to do tax supply chain planning. But on the other hand, the threat is there if you don't deal with it properly. Thank you. Uh, thank you. George, Philip, Marco, thank you for uh, some very informative presentations this morning. Uh, there was a time when we just used to make shirts and shoes. <laughs> Uh, the world has changed a lot. Um, I'm going to open the floor to some questions, please. If you have a question, could I ask you to also state your name and which company you're from? So uh, let me turn it over to the floor. So questions, please. I know it's Thursday morning. Yes, please. Uh, hello. Yes, uh, my name is Craig Morin. Uh, I work for Adidas. Um, so my question is, uh, I guess, partly to, to Marco, partly to George. And it's about when you are actually monitoring supply chain and you're out there looking at supplier risk and you actually, you know, have a supplier where you see a potential risk coming up, whether or not it's financial side or it's their operating process and procedures, how do you manage that process in terms of, yes, there are improvement programs, but if you don't see progress and you say, all right, I want to move away, that could actually create some additional risk because especially if it's financial, the supplier, and, and you take your business away, you have a reputational risk because that supplier is dependent on you. Do you understand what I'm asking? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or I guess, have you had an, uh, been through any circumstances of that? or? Well, uh, personally, I don't, because uh, uh, um, I, I, I think, you know, most of the, most of the clients, you know, uh, we, we, we deal with, you know, like they, they they they, they, they they use you know like they tend to use you know large suppliers you know reliable one, uh, but what I see is you know like um, it is uh, getting more frequent you know that uh, you know our clients will uh, do uh, you know uh, you know evaluation you know uh, any evaluation you know uh, of the supplier you know not just on the quality but also you know on you know different kinds of aspect, and uh, and I think you know one of the important thing is you know to really work with your supplier. To uh, cope with some of the challenges, you know, like uh, in terms of you know, uh, you know, uh, manufacturing, you know, uh, problems, you know, or you know, like labor problems, you know, if, uh, things like that, you know. Of course, you know, financial, uh, that is something that is, uh, if it comes up, you know, like they will, they will try to deal with it. But for example, like you know, like whether they can invest, you know, in the in the in the in the supplier, things like that. Yeah, but. Uh, but definitely, uh, we see it more frequently. That uh, you know, one thing that you see, you know, from the from the survey, you know, about about the managing the suppliers' relationship, I see more. We we see more proactive action, you know, about that, compared to just you know, oh, I can send my auditor, you know, to audit you, you know, whether you comply, you know, with our with our with our with our uh, 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 terms and condition. Yeah, it, it, it's it's. You know, like the, I think the attitude has changed. Yeah, uh, but again, you know, like, uh, but personally, I don't have this experience. But uh, what I see is, you know, uh, they understand that, you know, like if their suppliers fail, they also fail. Uh, the, the, the tie is getting stronger, so uh, they so they're trying to help uh, each other. Yeah. So just to, to add to what Marco was saying, in our experience, what we've seen is that if you're ready, if you're ready in a situation where um, you have a contract with this supplier and you're running into a lot of issues. Um, it's putting together a phased, a phased, a phase out plan, essentially. Because ordinarily what you would have is that as part of your take on process, um, the stipulations within the contract, you look at the assessment around how much risk am I actually taking by going with the supplier? Do I have a secondary supplier? in case of issues, um, whether it's around general supply, 
um, in case of issues, whether it's just around general supply. So in an ideal situation, if you don't already have that, what you do is you have a primary secondary supplier um, with different channels. Um, if that is not the case, and you, you're already dealing with this supply and you're looking for a way out, um, it's uh, to, to what Marco was saying about how you can work with that supplier, but still having an exit strategy. So even though you'd like to get out today, that in and of itself can result in, in some other liabilities that you may not want to, uh, to cough up immediately, but you would put together a roadmap um, to understand that, yes, eventually after a year, I will invest my time with this supplier and work through whatever problems that you're facing, but eventually I'm going to be phasing out into um, uh, to, to a new supply in the marketplace. Can, can I just add something to that? Because I think, I think you're right, but I think you know, one of, one of the um, things which we've noticed is that one of my, we had a speaker here a few weeks ago, and he talked about historically we were marauding garmentos, meaning we kind of sailed from cheap country to cheap country and, and, and kind of we were very tactical. Then we went through this, this process through which we had strategic relationships, and most of us I think now have pretty good, or certainly the bigger guys have big strategic relationships. So I think what we're now finding is not around just managing those strategic relationships with suppliers, it's about managing those relationships with the stakeholders. So if we are going to change one of our relationships with a supplier and we know it's going to have a major impact potentially on for risk for us, but also an implication for the country or the community or that supplier himself, how we connect with the local authority, how we connect with the local press, how we connect with the local NGOs, how we connect with the local union. I'll often say that my job these days is managing geopolitical risk. That's pretty much what I do. Spend an awful lot of time talking to the different authorities to make sure that excuse me, when the shit hits the fan, it, it doesn't spray too far. <laughs> so, uh, it's a, it's, it's a, so I think we've gone beyond even that strategic relationship with just with the supplier. It's with that broader community because we can't be marauding gum into us anymore. Anyway, sorry, you had a question. Clients have come to us um, and uh, one of my questions is to do with um, managing regulators. Mm -hmm. um, so what uh, some of our clients are trying to do is to uh, build regulatory best practices uh, in countries, uh, in, in new emerging markets mm -hmm. like Vietnam and Indonesia. Are you aware or are you seeing any kind of um, um, partnerships, bilateral partnerships or regional partnerships where these regulatory best practices are brought from China and Taiwan to other new emerging markets, or, or just capacity building programs? Well, uh, again, you know, like, I think, I think, I know, like, it, I think regulatory management is, uh, is, is something that, you know, like, uh, each country, you know, has, uh, really have their own, you know, like, the, the practice, you know, and, uh, but of course, you know, what I, what I observe, you know, like, the regulator in the emerging market, you know, they always try to learn, you know, from other regulators, you know, you know, of other country, you know, and I can talk about China, you know, because, uh, you know, we deal with a lot of regulators, you know, and they're, they're very interested, you know, like to know what's the U.S. is thinking, you know, what, what's the other country is thinking. Of course, you know, they won't say that, well, we will learn from the U.S., you know. Eventually, like, even though they borrow, you know, some of the rules from the U.S., but they will do the, put it in the, in the higher level, you know, it'll become more stringent, you know. Uh, but uh, I think, I think um, the good thing is, you know, like, uh, a lot of them, you know, like they're open to, you know, like they're very quite open, you know, like to talk, you know, they, they, they want to discuss, you know, like they want to understand, you know, uh, uh, the, 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 the situation in the market. And one thing that, you know, uh, that we do, we, 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 we uh, as a consulting firm, you know, we often tell them that, okay, well, this is the voice, you know, that we hear from the industry. Of course, they also hear it, but, you know, we, we talk about, you know, from this perspective, and then we, we bring in, okay, well, how the other countries, you know, are dealing with it. And, uh, and we do some benchmarking for them. I think this is something that, you know, like uh, my clients, you know, often ask me, you know, to sometimes they have some questions, you know. They say, well, can you, you know, like bring this, you know, to the regulator and really help us, you know, like to, 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 to uh, convey the message, you know, to really, you know, help them to understand the situation. Uh, as far as, you know, like moving to the other emerging market, uh, Right at this moment, I don't have that experience, you know. 
I'm not sure whether George, you know, or Phillips, you know, you have. To Vietnam, or uh, I don't, I, I don't see that. But this is something that we could propose. <laughs> yeah, um, I think we have time for one or two more questions. If there are any, uh, any other questions, please. Uh, my name is Noel. I uh, work for a French company called Kiabi. It's one of the biggest retailers in France. We do a billion euro business from China, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Cambodia, Myanmar. So very interesting and very concise talk today, but all of the photographs and so forth are, you know, these are what has happened. And, you know, to be honest, maybe 10 Rana plazas could happen tomorrow because nothing has changed since the day that happened. Mm -hmm. The, you know, compliance and the building controls and all those things. So all the things we're talking about are what we can do if it happens tomorrow, what can we do, what can we do? Has anything been done with the governments in those countries to say, let's have a five year, a 10 year, a 15 year plan to regulate the garment business in, in each of these countries to make it better and more, you know, so that these things don't happen on a, on a government level, mm -hmm. so that they improve the social, you know, outlook for their own citizens make sure that you know building regulations are robust make sure there's some integrity in the process so i was just wondering the short term is the things maybe that's my my perception today these are short term things that we talked about what's the long term view that governments will take to improve these industries in their country so, so i think that i believe the us is leading the, the charge in terms of just overall um, social responsibility and compliance um, with uh, US-based multinational corporations within the region. Uh, so they're working with each of those governments. So an example is in Bangladesh, um, there are loans that are being given out to um, manufacturers to improve their infrastructure. Um, and, and that's just one example. So the, the, the importance is, and I know that MNCs realize um, public perception and, and what impact that can have on their business. Um, so the government sees the, the benefits from an investment standpoint and the need to be able to work with, with these um, uh, MNCs to be able to drive some of those improvements that we've talked about around infrastructure, um, around uh, safety, and overall compliance, um, the age of you know, the um, not using uh, young labor, and so on and so forth. Um, so, w without p p you know pulling up any particular example, there's a lot of examples to be able to be given for each of those countries. So there is a, a long term, uh, long term view in, in addressing that. Let me let me just jump in there because I think um, there's a lot happened in Bangladesh over the past 18 months. Um, the Alliance and the Accord were two organizations that were set up. The Alliance was set up primarily by U.S. retailers uh, and U.S. brands, and the Accord was set up primarily by European retailers and brands. Mm -hmm. um, but those two organizations have basically been working to inspect all the factories in Bangladesh, all the factories that they do business with in Bangladesh. And we're board members of the, uh, of the Accord Alliance. Uh, and I personally have probably spent, I don't know, 60 days within, in the past year in Bangladesh kind of working on these issues. Uh, a lot of conversations have gone on uh, and I'm, I'm, I would say the plan is for all of the factories to have been inspected that the US Alliance is using and the Accord to be using by the middle of this year. The ILO has taken the responsibility of inspecting the factories that are not covered by the Alliance and the Accord. And there was a roundabout, memory serves, about 2,000 factories they're going to inspect and they're going to be done by April. Uh, we've also been connecting with the, uh, with the BGMEA in Bangladesh. We're also connecting with the Bangladesh government, and I've had a number of meetings with the government myself where we're actually giving them building codes with regards to what the building codes should be in place in Bangladesh. 
All the factories that have been inspectors and inspected have remediation plans. We personally have put out loans of $10 million to factories in Bangladesh to help them remediate their facilities. So we're actually loaning those factories at Hong Kong interest rates, not Bangkok in, and not Bangladesh interest rates. <laughs> and Bangladesh interest rates are crazy. So a kind of 17, 18% where we're, we're offering them loans at kind of four or five percent. Um, based upon long-term relationships with them. So, and one of the things that I think we're trying to do as a chamber, and please, I welcome you to come and join us. And we actually had a meeting yesterday with Lian Fung, uh, PVH, Under Armour, um, Ralph Lauren, Target, Walmart, basically all trying to come together and to put together a group of values that we as an industry want to kind of try and stand behind to say, you know, because most of it, we talk about all this CSR, but most of it we all kind of agree with. We're not going to have child labor. Nobody's going to argue with that. You know, we're not going to have forced labor. Yeah. Nobody's going to argue with that. We don't want buildings to fall down. Yeah. You know, there's some real basic stuff that we can kind of align behind. And so there is, I think there is a lot going on. And one of the things we've been doing when we go to other countries, and I was recently in Africa, we took the building codes that were put together by the Alliance and the Accord and gave them to the Prime Minister of, of Kenya, the President of Uganda, and I can't remember, the one of Tanzania, I can't remember who it was, but, and said to them, these are the building codes we expect you to have in legislation in order for us to come and bring business to you. So I think there is a groundswell that's kind of coming together to try and address those things. So I'm much more optimistic that we're kind of moving these things forward. Sorry, I've got my soapbox a little bit. It's something I'm quite <laughs> passionate about. Uh, listen, I think uh, unless there's any other questions, I'm going to... Uh, take this opportunity to thank these gentlemen for their speeches this morning. We have a small gift here for you. Let me give this to you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much. If you could please join me in giving these guys a round of applause for a great introduction this morning. Um, Lots of future events happening at the Chamber. I encourage you to, to look on the internet and see what else is coming up. We have lots of stuff coming on over the next few weeks. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank you all and wish you all a great weekend.